Excellent. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to class number two of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy class. And in case you can't tell, I am super excited to talk about Vogon poetry tonight. Um, so, oops. Uh, let's see. Hang on a second. I need to... Where did that go? My notes. Okay, there it is. Got it. Uh, all right. Excellent. I have to remember my announcements. If I don't have my notes, I forget what my announcements are. All right. Um, so welcome, everybody. Hey, Jennifer, funny you should start off that way. We're going to come back to that later on in the class. You're, you're prescient uh, in your perception of where we're headed tonight. Uh, anyway, okay. So uh, uh, quick announcement before I begin here tonight. Um, and that is uh, uh, Mythgard Movie Club. So I hope you guys, uh, some of you were able to catch the first session of the Mythgard Movie Club, uh, which happened this past Monday. Um, and if you haven't, you should watch it on YouTube because uh, it's a really fun discussion. And the, uh, the, however, the thing I wanted to announce is uh, on the Mythgard forums, there is going to be a uh, uh, sort of nominations and discussion for the next uh, session. So to decide the film that they do next in the next uh, Mythgard Film Club, uh, you can uh, um, you can you can contribute to that discussion and uh, you know have some influence on what movie they do next. So uh, if you just go to forums.signumuniversity.org, that's the Mythgard forums, and scroll all the way down to the bottom, and there's the uh, the the Mythgard Movie Club one, and you will see the place to talk about the 2018 uh, Movie Club selections. So. Uh, anyway, so that'll be uh, that'll be really good. So I hope you can join in that discussion uh, there. All right, the uh, um, I wanted to start tonight before we get to the text, and I have a lot of text to talk about tonight. But before we get to the text, um, I wanted to start with a, a general comment, um, and it's it's interesting because this is of course a subject. I've talked about a lot. In fact, I spent some time talking about it in my first ever podcast episode that I recorded more than a decade ago. Um, but it was really kind of coming into play for me a lot last week. So I wanted to address it. Um, that is, there were there were a lot of, um, of comments that people were making last time that I didn't get to, do, to sort of address individually. And I wanted to kind of address them sort of collectively uh, before we begin. And that is, there were a lot of people who were really interested in making comments about the connection between stuff that Douglas Adams refers to in the book and the contemporary world. Like, for instance, um, there were bunches and bunches of you who were really, really interested in the color of the small pieces of paper uh, that uh, were failing to solve the uh, happiness problem uh, on the earth. And the question is like, does that, you know, the fact that they're green, does that mean he's referring to America? And if so, what does that, what does that suggest? And what is he, what is he saying? What is he implying about America and all that stuff? Or, you know, if that's the case, I, I get it. Like, I, I'm, what I want to say is not that I think that those questions are uninteresting or unimportant. But what I do want to say is I don't want to talk about that. Um, and let me just, I want to explain why I don't want to talk about that. Um, the reason is you want to be very careful the order in which you do things, okay? Um, that is to say, let's think about the green pieces of paper for a second. So if you want to answer the question, what comment, you know, uh, if... If you want to run with the theory, right, that he is making some kind of comment about America, the American economy, right, or American culture, if that is an argument you want to make, I'm not saying that that's my interpretation, I'm just saying, if you want to make an argument like that, right, if you want, to, if you want to, in my opinion, do that properly, you must first understand, you must first understand how that comment fits in the book. Like, what's he talking, what's he saying about money? If we just leap on that passage, right? Hey, he's talking about little green pieces of paper. Why green? Is America. What does that suggest about America? Well, we're not equipped to answer that question yet, right? You'll remember later on in the class, we went on to point out that although he speaks very, you know, sort of disparagingly of money, right? As if like the whole caring about money thing and the whole bizarre, weird, you know, parochial earth concept that the moving around of little pieces of paper could have anything to do with happiness. 
you know, the, the, the attitude of that paragraph is completely undermined by what we see in the rest of the galaxy and the rest of the story. Right. So if we just see that one passage and immediately leap to trying to draw conclusions and and make connections and work outwards from there, we're not doing it right. Right. In fact, at the end of the day, we're the joke's likely to be on us. Right. We're likely to to, uh, fire off in uh, at least a very incautious direction. Right. Uh, If we don't first stop to look at the big picture. So my point is not. Don't make any, you know, that it's illegal or something, you know, to make any connections to the outside world. What I am saying is don't do it first. You can't do that first, right? First, make sure you're getting the picture about how, like, how does this work treat treat money, right? In a vacuum. Again, forget about everything else. What does this story give us about money, right? And the treatment and theme of money throughout the book. Once we see that pattern, that whole pattern, then we're equipped to answer, to ask, and even to answer the question, right? What might this have to do? Is there a contemporary thing that this connects with? There were people who were, um, uh, uh, who'd need to, yes, yeah, so Mike, that, that's a really good example. Uh, uh, Mike says, if, if, if you do want to make an argument that it's, it's anything about America, wouldn't you also want to put that green pieces of paper passage in context with the references to New York and McDonald's. Absolutely you would, right? I mean, there's definitely uh, a bunch of data points that you would need to consider in order to make a, a, a sort of informed and well-rounded, informed from the context of the story, right? And again, this is, at the end of the day, one of my primary objections to bringing in external stuff, right? To bring in, you know, to, to think, even if you know that it's true, right? Even if you you've, uh, even if, you know, Douglas Adams has said, this is totally what I was thinking of when I wrote that passage, right? That to me still doesn't justify this. Um, or rather, it, it's not that it doesn't justify talking about it. What it doesn't justify is launching directly into that, right? Hang on to that, right? Wait, wait. First understand its role in the text and then see how it works. Um, and never trust the author. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't mean that the author lies. I just mean knowing what the author said he or she was thinking about when they wrote a passage and perceiving how that passage actually fits into the story are two different things. Um, you know, I mean, just think of how often you've heard really good authors um, talk about how they didn't, they don't really know where these things, this, where the, how the story just grows and have a life of its own. Think of all the time we've spent talking about, you know, the way that Tolkien speaks of like discovering things rather than inventing them, right? Um, that's kind of it's it's so when I say don't trust the author, I just mean no author, no good author anyway that I know of is really in complete control, you know, and if they are, if they think they are, I tend not to believe them, actually. Um, uh, so yeah, Tony, exactly. It also applies to bi- using biographical information as literary criticism. It is so easy to sort of seize on something and go, and go herring off. Like Tony, Baron and Luthien, right? You know, the whole biographical angle on Baron and Luthien. Obviously, it's not that that's irrelevant, right? I mean, like, he had Luthien put on his wife's tombstone. It's relevant, right? But you can't start there, right? If from the first moment you're, you're really thinking through, you know, if you approach Baron and Luthien thinking about Edith, right, and, 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 and Ronald, um, if that's what's in your head from the beginning, you're going to bias your entire reading. You're going to start with an idea and you're going to you're going to read the text into that idea rather than trying to get an understanding of what the te- you know rather than seeing the patterns within the text and then thinking about how does this story that we're seeing connect and so now okay think about Baron and Luthien first then given the the tombstone right now what conclusions can we come to it's it, it is very much the same uh, the same kind of thing um Yes, and Yana, exactly. I also disbelieve J.K. Rowling. And, you know, Yana, it's really funny. I remember when I once, this because this was back, like, right when number seven had just come out, and I was interviewed for this, like, Harry Potter site, and I made this, like, blasphemous comment that I didn't believe her, 
that, you know, when she said, like, she knew everything that was coming, I'm like, baloney, right? It's just, it's obviously not true. I mean, you read book two, and it's very clear that his idea of the significance of the diary of Tom Riddle, that changes over the course of the series, right? And the, 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 the funny thing, Yana, is that the Harry Potter fans thought it was insulting J.K. Rowling. Like, that I was, like, marginalizing her and saying she is, like, an insufficiently brilliant author. Uh, But I was attempting to compliment her, actually. Uh, Because if I did believe her, that she had everything in mind from the beginning, I would think less of her, not more, right? The great authors discover they don't invent, right? So that whole posture that she has adopted, that, you know, for years that she has adopted of, like, I am in charge of everything and I have always known all things, I think it's very unwise, of her. Um, again, that's not, that's not how it actually works, really. Um, and it's because I respect her and I think the Harry Potter stories are genuinely good that I disbelieve her. Um, it's, it's, anyway. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, anyway, I, so I hope, uh, I hope that you understand. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't misunderstand and, and think that I'm, um, uh, that I'm, you know, asking for fewer comments or something like that. I just want to, I just, it was something that I noticed last time. I, I got a way higher density of, um, of those kinds of making connections to the contemporary world, you know, what was going on in the 70s and, and everything else. Um, I was also put in mind of Tolkien's words when he was addressing the whole World War II allegory of the, the nuclear bomb thing, right? When he said it, how it's, it's, it's naturally, um, you know, tempting when the lives of an author and a critic have overlapped, uh, right, that they tend to think that the shared experience, they tend to sort of elevate the view of those shared experiences, right? And the point that he was making, yeah, like, those of you who went through World War II at the same time, you're going to be thinking about World War II, and that's understandable, but you're forgetting, you know, that uh, it's that doesn't mean that it's the answer, right? Howsoever vivid World War II is in your mind, World War II was not the influence on The Lord of the Rings, because it was written mostly before World War II. Um and so I think you know, it's the same thing for those of us who remember, you know, the 70s when this book was written. Um, and I won't pretend. I barely do. I was very young in the 70s. Uh, but anyway, you know, for, for, for those of us, it's, again, there's that same temptation, right, to be like, oh, yeah, this is, uh, I'm very, you know, I'm sort of very, very close to this, right? Quite possibly, right? I mean, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not saying that the interpretations are wrong. I'm just saying that... Um, you have to be cautious, right? You have to be, you have to, you have to just, just, just look at the text first and then you can draw your conclusions. Anyway. Okay. Um, so, uh, that was, my, that was the, the, as I said, and that's kind of in the interest of addressing, I didn't want people to, cause I was ignoring a whole bunch of, cause I didn't want to get sidetracked on this last time. So I was kind of skipping a whole bunch of, uh, a, a whole set of comments. And I always wanted to kind of explain why I was and, uh, and kind of address it as a whole here. So, all right. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's, let's move on. Let's move on to, um, the, uh, Second section here. Picking up after the end of the world. Here's the transition into the next uh, chapter, immediately after the destruction of the Earth. Far away on the opposite spiral arm of the galaxy, 500,000 light years from the star Sol, Zaphod Beeblebrox, president of the Imperial Galactic Government, sped across the seas of Damagrin, his ion drive delta boat winking and flashing in the Damagrin sun. Damagrin the hot. Damagrin the remote. Damagrin the almost totally unheard of. Damagrin the secret home of the heart of gold. Okay, so notice as we shift, like the, the, the world has gone away, right? The world has been destroyed. So as we shift away from the terrestrial viewpoint, remember that the thing, you know, the thing that I was pointing to that I found one of the real, you know, that I find one of the most interesting effects of the first few chapters are the way in which on the one hand, our own sort of parochial earth, you know, geocentric um, assumptions and and point of view is sort of teased, 
right? But at the same time, as we're being teased for having a parochial and geocentric worldview in which we think that, you know, the Earth is, like, actually important or, like, pretty much the whole world, right? Even you think about the, think about the use of the phrase, the end of the world, right? Um, think about the, the implications of that phrase, right? How it's... Remember when, um, when Arthur says to Ford, um, but do you trust him? Right, Mr. Prosser? Do you trust him to lie in front of his own bulldozer, right, and prevent my house being knocked down? And Ford says, I trust him to the end of the world. That play on that phrase is really pointed, right? Because that expression, I trust him to the end of the world, we hear that, and it sounds like he said, I, I, I would trust him for all, th- I trust him absolutely, I could not express a stronger trust for him than that, right? I trust him until the end of time. The end of the world and the end of time, it's like they're synonyms, right? But of course, what we get by the end of chapter three is an introduction to a wider perspective in which the end of the world, our world, Earth, is uh, not only very soon, right, but is a small and inconsiderable thing, right? Nobody even, nobody else even notices that it happened. Um, it's no different from Arthur's rather unattractive house being knocked down in order to build a bypass. Nobody else cares. Remember everybody at the pub staring at him with slack-jawed expressions, right, and glazed eyes because he was boring them by ranting about the local council and what they were going to do breaking down his house, right? Um, it's the 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 attitude of the entire rest of the galaxy to the end of the world is the same right um so uh already that's um uh we we can see that kind of play right that play and that you know that way in which uh, we're being, again, sort of teased for the assumptions that we have uh, in our own point of view um, and being challenged, therefore, to stretch things outward, right? If we are just looking at the world and not thinking about anything else, if we think the world is the most important thing, we're kind of like Arthur, you know, brushing his teeth and making his coffee, uh, ignoring the bulldozers that are right side, right outside of his window, right? Just totally wrapped up in our own little world. So again, one effect to broaden that, right, to get us outside that, um, and to prompt us to look at the earth in that completely different way. But then, of course, there's the irony, then there's the joke, which is that when we do that, when we do look outwards to take in the wider world, now world in, in, in quotation marks, right, of the whole rest of the galaxy, it's actually not as different as we might have thought, right? And that's... Uh, most emphatically communicated there in chapter three by the uh, extremely obvious uh, and indeed like comically belabored um, parallel, right, between Mr. Prosser and his yellow bulldozers and uh, prosthetic Bolgan Jelts and his uh, destructor fleet, or excuse me, constructor fleet, though it's hard to tell the difference, um, which are also yellow. Uh, and, you know, making the same speeches about uh, uh, having time to study the plans that have been on display. Um, Yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, um, uh, yeah, so, okay, Um, the, um, So where do we get? Now that the world has been destroyed, that was my first question now going into this, right? So transitioning after the end of the world, now where are we as readers, right? Where are we being placed as receivers of this text, as receivers of this story, now that we've been sort of forcibly, not just invited to look beyond our world, right, but sort of forcibly ejected from our world. We're forced to look past our world because it's not even there anymore, right? It's just a wisp of ozone, uh, and so all we can see is the rest of the galaxy now, right? What does it look like? How are we going to be interested? And so that's the transition that we get here. And notice, we get first the assertion of distance. Uh, you'll remember that our planet was in a, uh, an unfashionable backwater, right? Uh, on, and now we're going to another spiral arm of the galaxy, which also seems kind of backwaterish, or at least private, right? Uh, uh, because nobody wants to live there, because there are such incon- lovely but inconveniently wide oceans uh, between all of the islands. Um, we get the name Zephod Beeblebrox which is an odd name, right? It sounds, it's 
could be more alien than that, but it's a weird sounding name, right? That that's not a name that would fit in, right? Not nearly so well as Ford Prefect, for instance. Um, and what's more, he is president of the Imperial Galactic Government. That sounds really impressive, right? I mean, that sounds like that sounds like um, you know Phantom Menace politics level impressive, right? Um, so that's a big deal. His ion drive Delta boat. Now, I have no idea what that is. Um, now, ion drive, I know what an ion is, um, and I know what a drive is, uh, and I can imagine how a drive would be connected with a boat. I don't know what an ion drive is, and I have no idea what the word delta is. Again, I know what the word delta means, but I have no idea. So we have this, like, conglomeration of terms, ion drive delta boat, which conveys a vague idea to me, right? If it's an ion drive, it obviously involves some kind of chemistry or physics that I don't understand, right? Um, This is not an alpha boat, nor a beta boat, nor even a gamma boat, right? This is a delta boat. So this is like fourth level boatness, right? But again, the impressions that are being conveyed to me are quite vague. I don't have much uh, to sort of grasp onto to help me imagine or understand exactly what it is uh, that he's... uh, that he's talking about. And Arthur, I agree, the important thing seems to be it sounds cool, right? And that, that's definitely what, um, what, what Zephod is all about. Um, Patrick, yes, it sounds relatively exotic. Uh, and notice that same sense of exoticness. Is there a noun? There isn't, is there? Is there a noun form of exotic? There needs to be. Is there one? Ex- ex- exotitude? Huh? Ah? Eh? Exoticude, right? Exoticism. Well, that kind of sounds like eroticism. So that's kind of yeah, it's kind of risque there, Jennifer. I don't know. Uh, exoticism. Exo- <laughs> Exoticity <laughs> suggests true and Arthur. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, um. See, when in doubt, I go with etude as an ending because it's usually funnier than most other endings. I'm going to go with exotitude because that, that kind of rolls off the tongue a little better, too. Uh, uh, anyway, okay. Um, exoticity? Yeah, that seems to be popular. Several people are suggesting exoticity. It's harder to say, though. See, I mean, I gotta... You gotta... You gotta make, this is a mistake people make about children's names too. This is the, this was so important. When my wife and I were naming our kids, we like went around, it was like, you've got to, you actually have to say it out loud lots and lots of times. And like in combinations with middle name and last name, and you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta hear it. You gotta feel it in your mouth, make sure it works. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Anyway, sorry. All right. Exoticity, exotitude. I'm sticking with exotitude. So the exotitude, that's exactly the note. And okay, sorry, now I've lost my train of thought. Who was, who was, it was it Patrick? It was you who originally said the adjective exotic. As Patrick was suggesting, I think that, uh, uh, that exotitude is exactly what's picked up on that second paragraph, right? Damagrin the hot, Damagrin the remote, Damagrin the almost totally unheard of, right? So, which is interesting because obviously it's unheard of to us, right? But we're being told the first that we're hearing about it is that it's unheard of. So that's uh, kind of helps us not to um, um, uh, uh, not to feel bad, right? Um, uh, about not having heard of it, right? That's kind of like the joke. Like, if you haven't heard of Damagrin, have you? Well, nobody has, right? So there you are. Um, uh, which is itself an interesting kind of mood move. So when we, okay, so when we see this wider world, it's not jarring, it's not extremely strange, though how far distant it is and how exotic this is compared to the Earth is one of the first things that's emphasized. When we're told about the crowd of people that's waiting for President Zaphod Beeblebrox, uh, which is a really fun name to say, so I'm going to say Zaphod Beeblebrox as often as I can because it's entertaining, at least to me, um... The crowd of people waiting to uh, hear Zephod Beeblebrox, um, their description, they're extremely alien, right? I mean, they're all aliens, 
But these guys are pretty alien, right? It consisted in large part of the engineers and researchers who had built the Heart of Gold. Mostly humanoid, but here and there were a few reptiloid atomineers, two or three green sylph-like maximegaloticians, an octopodic uh, phys, uh, physuctroist, physuctroist or two, and a hulavu. A hulavu is a superintelligent shade of the color blue. All except the Hulavu were resplendent in their multicolored ceremonial lab coats. The Hulavu had been temporarily refracted into a freestanding prism for the occasion. Um, now, uh, I, uh, I love this, right? Um, notice that, notice the sort of, notice the way the alienness kind of creeps in here, right? On the one hand, as he goes through the list of the alien species there, right, he prompts us to think more and more sort of outside our normal mode, right? Mostly humanoid, right? Um, and then reptiloid. Okay, all right, I can see lizard man, right? I'm thinking lizard man, I can picture that, that's easy enough. Not too much of a straf- stretch. Green sylph-like creatures. Okay, well, they're like sylphs. Okay, I can picture sylphs, kind of winged fairy kind of creatures. Okay, that's fine. Um, Octopodic. Okay, so uh, humanoid, reptiloid, now octopodic. Again, I can imagine that, but now I have a harder time. Like, if they're octopodic, that means they have eight feet. Does it mean they're like an octopus? Probably not. I mean, I'm imagining an octopus, but I don't really have any idea what they're like. Are they like actually tentacular or do they just have eight legs? They have eight legs in a row like a, like a, like a centipede or, you know, like a, like a long ant or, or again, are they tentacular? Um, I don't even know. Um, uh, so it, it hard, it becoming harder for me to imagine. And then of course, uh, trying to envision, trying to conceive of, because it's hard to really visually picture a super intelligent shade of the color blue, right? So the the race the races of the the engineers in question uh, sort of escalate right into more and more uh, into greater and greater strangeness. But the thing which is to me the real kicker is the is their their job descriptions, right? Um, which become much stranger than the racial descriptions. Right? We start with engineers and researchers at the beginning of the paragraph, and then atomineers. Okay, it's like an engineers, but instead of engines, it's atoms, I guess. Okay, like I that's a new word on me, but I can kind of put it together, right? Maxa megalatricians, like megaliticians, I keep adding an R. Maxa megaliticians. I have no idea. I mean, again, like, I can understand most bits of that word, but when I try to put all those bits together, it's like big, big something or other. Does it have to do with math? I, I don't think so, but maybe it I mean, I guess it might, right? Um, uh, <laughs> David is wondering if they manipulate reality via maxims. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a good question, right? Um, uh, yeah, uh, galacticians, maxim megalacticians, right? Which makes you wonder: Is mega supposed to be a thing? Is that is this mega, or is that a is that an accident, right? Because it's galactic, right? Maxim megalacticians. Ah, I did it again. Megalacticians. No, I did it right. Okay, maxim megalacticians. So I got no idea. No, I, I could kind of put together atom uh, atomineers, but I can't do anything with. Maximegalacticians. Um, uh, I, I can't even say this. Physicturalist. So it's like structuralist or cult. No, it's like structuralist, but it's physicturalist. Physicturalist. No idea. Have to do with physics and um, structuralists. I guess, maybe, physics structure, probably. Anyway, but again, you see the point, right? It's, it's touching base with the things that we're familiar with, not just, again, not, not wholly without 
frame of reference for us, and yet it's sort of spiraling out of control, right? Until again, we end up with the hula vu, um, which I can't even picture, right? I mean, how 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 do you have like a sentient uh, and indeed super intelligent shade of the color blue? Like, in what form does it? Is it just like a? I kind of imagine like a a blue gas kind of floating around, right? Is that it? I don't even know. Is it in gaseous form? Is it in liquid form? And I couldn't imagine how, you know, what the legs of the octopodic dude uh, were like. I certainly can't picture. I, I, I don't even know what what state of matter the Huluvu mostly exists in. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because exactly, Stephen, it's a shade itself. It's not a blue something. Which is why I say to me it, um, uh, to me it 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 kind of defies visualization, right? Um, because it's not yeah it's not something which is blue. It is a shade of the color blue itself. So can it even be light? Like it's because if it's light, then it's blue light, right? It's not which is not the same thing as being a shade of the color blue. Um, so. Um, yeah. I, I, anyway, I, like I said, I, I don't even, uh, uh, I don't even know. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, but the bigger point that I would make about this paragraph is that, although I feel like increasingly at sea as we go through this paragraph, this is the kind of thing I was expecting, right? This, in in a sense, although again, although I don't understand it, it fulfills my expectations. Now we've left Earth behind, and so this is the kind, you know what could be more likely than meeting somebody who is octopodic or a super intelligent shade of the color blue, right? Having been urged to leave, you know, my parochial um, terrestrial viewpoint behind, I, I I'm not uh, shocked or, or appalled uh, to uh, uh, to to imagine this stuff, right? And yet, we don't leave things behind, right? Again, at the same time, just as I was saying in the first three chapters, we get things moving in both directions, right? The boat zipped and skipped across the sea, the sea that lay between the main islands of the only archipelago of any useful size on the whole planet. Zephod Beeblebrox was on his way from the tiny spaceport on Easter Island the name was an entirely meaningless coincidence. In galactic speak, Easter means small, flat, and light brown. To the heart of Gold Island, which by another meaningless coincidence was called France. One of the side effects of work on the heart of gold was a whole string of pretty meaningless coincidences. Now, I am perfectly willing to believe that the coincidences um, are meaningless, right? Um, okay. Like, I'm not saying that this necessarily means that it has to do with France, but that, um, that statement, to say that those things are meaningless coincidences is to ignore an obvious thing, right? And that is the fact that both of them refer to the Earth. Which is it's again? It might be meaningless in the sense of being unintended, right? Not a not a not a purposeful reference to Earth things, right? This island may indeed have absolutely nothing to do and nothing in common with France, uh, you know, with the with the nation called France in Earth's Europe. But the fact that the name Easter Island and the name France have both been attached to these two bodies of land on the planet Damagrin is interesting, right? Um, I, and one that I can't escape, right? We, and the reason that I find it so interesting is that, once again, I, I, I see this same pattern, right? Things are alien. You're not in Kansas anymore. And yet, you're going to see things that will remind you of Kansas a whole lot. And indeed, we should not. We find as soon as we start seeing the people, hearing from them, and seeing how they act and how they think and how they talk, that we should not, in fact, forget Kansas at all, right? 
even at the same time that we're being asked to remember that it's all alien. Um, Zephod Bibelbrox is a, a sort of a familiar enough type, right? Um, uh, it's uh, um, he's he, he's alien in the sense that he has two heads and three arms, right? And yet, for him to have both of his chins rakishly covered with stubble and unshaven projects the same kind of social effect on, you know, Demigrant or wherever Zephod Beeblebrox happens to be that it does on Earth, right? Um, the fundamental similarities, um, which may be coincidences or may not, right? I can't, um, I can't escape. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, a couple people are referring to the improbability drive. Yes and no. Again, I'm not saying that the fact that these two things refer to Earth, that there are two islands that have the same name as land masses on Earth, is a coincidence that is outside the realm of explicability given the improbability drive. That's not the point that I'm making. The point is not that the two land masses are both named after Earth places, right? Are both named after places on the same planet. That's not the thing that's so improbable. The thing that's so improbable is the thing that is completely outside of the effect of the improbability drive, namely us as readers, right? It's not the fact that they're from the same planet on the same small speck of rock from the uh, opposite side of the galaxy that's so strange. That is a strange coincidence, but it's a strange coincidence well within the ability of the improbability drive to explain, right? The thing that is to me the most striking and significant coincidence is that the small planet on the other side of the galaxy from which both of those names are drawn is our planet, right? That having left our planet behind because it was just destroyed, having now been pushed off into this wider world which doesn't know about the Earth and doesn't care about it, the very first planet which is totally unheard of that we meet shares a name with two Earth land masses, right? Um, yeah, um... But, no, Jana, you're still not seeing what I'm saying. You, Jana Steen Redeker, the reader, are outside of the frame of the, impro in, of the improbability drive, right? That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the... What I am interested in, in large part, is the relationship between the text, the narrator, and us as readers. And what messages are we as readers of this book being given. In part, one of the things I'm still trying to figure out is, who's the narrator? What's the frame of the narrator here, right? What's the frame of reference of the narrator? Um, uh, so, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, um, and this is, that's why I find this such an interesting, and that it comes right here, right? That it comes right here in like the first couple paragraphs of when we've theoretically left Earth entirely behind, right? Um, let's think about the narrator and the tone of the narrator. Here's a narrator explaining to us about Vogons. He was the way he was, that is, prosthetic Vogon gels. Because billions of years ago, when the Vogons had first crawled out of the sluggish primeval seas of Vogsphere, and had lain panting and heaving on the planet's virgin shores, when the first rays of the bright young Vogsol sun had shone across them that morning, it was as if the forces of evolution had simply given up on them there and then, had turned aside in disgust, and written them off as an ugly and unfortunate mistake. They never evolved again. They should never have survived." The fact that they did is some kind of tribute to the thick-willed, slug-brained stubbornness of these creatures. 
Evolution, they said to themselves, who needs it? And what nature refused to do for them, they simply did without until such time as they were able to rectify the gross anatomical inconveniences with surgery. Think about the point of view of the narrator here, right? Um, now, admittedly, the narrator isn't telling us what actually happened, right? We're not being given a historical insight into the actual events of, you know, the birth of the Vogon race, right? Notice that the dominant um, uh, phrase here, like the, 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 the operative phrase is as if. It was as if the forces of evolution had simply given up on them, right? Um, uh, that is, he's characterizing it He's not telling us what actually happened, right? Um, so, he's, he's characterizing the Vogon, but, but it, at the same time, the metaphor that he uses, or mm, simile, really, that he uses, right, the the, the this sort of extended comparison that he's drawing um, to try to explain, to try to give us a sense of why Vogons are the way they are, right? And notice what he's accomplishing in this description, which is really quite clever. On the one hand, he's helping us to understand the physical nature of the Vogons, right? Why is it like that they look not only horrible, right? Uh, but, uh, uh, I mean, like, the, I love the fact that he does not describe the Vogons um, in, uh, um, like, from one end to the next. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't just, like, do a full description of them. He just drops references to things like his eyebrows rose until they obscured his nose, right? So, so like, you learn that Vogons have their noses above their eyebrows, but we don't really know how that works or what that looks like. I have to actually say, um, for this reason, uh, I think that I'm trying to be cautious in how I'm saying it. Visual adaptation of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is challenging. And it's a big deal, right? The way that the Vogons are treated, the way that they're described, the few tidbits that were given about their physical description to me are less important than the fact that we are left free to just kind of take those bits and sort of jumble them together and construct in our own heads the most, like, repulsive and unpleasant-looking thing that we can imagine, right? Um, our own imaginations are unhampered by the descriptions <laughs> that he gives. Uh, in fact, they're just kind of, they're just kind of uh, prodded. Right, our, our imaginations, um, but then left to get on with it themselves. Um, and you can't do that. When you're doing a visual adaptation and you have to actually design a, a Vogon costume and put somebody in it, or a Vogon Muppet and have somebody run it, um, or a Vogon CGI, you know, and have somebody program it, um, you're, you're, you're making choices. Right Now, that's always true. Um, but here, it seems like uh, an especially large step to have to take, uh, and I don't, um, I don't envy them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, notice the things that the narrator implies without actually saying, right? Um, it was as if the forces of evolution had simply given up on them there and then, had turned aside in disgust, and written them off as an ugly and unfortunate mistake. So, first we have the personification 
of the forces of evolution, which phrase emphasizes the impersonal nature of the, even the plurality of forces, right, uh, sort of helps to remind us that evolution, in fact, gets on by trial and error, right? Evolution gets on by natural selection. Some things die and other things don't, right? The whole point of the uh, doctrine of evolution by natural selection is that there's no plan behind it, right? That there is no personification constructing it. Um, and he personifies the forces of evolution, right? And in doing so, um, conjures up this idea of some kind of superior intelligence, right? Um, some kind of like quasi divine perspective who has abandoned the Vogons, right? They are, they are, they are God forsaken. They're a God forsaken race, right? Um, in this sort of semi literal sense in the context of the simile, right? They've been given up on. Um, and and that, that's not enough, right? That whoever, the, that the forces of evolution have turned aside in disgust and written them off as a mistake, as an ugly and unfortunate mistake. Um, that's, uh, that's really, that's really interesting, right? Um, and, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, Right, and Ollie, they're destined for civil service, right? They're destined to become to become bureaucrats, and that sort of, this whole joke then kind of folds into the joke at the expense of bureaucrats uh, there. Um, but, but, yeah, Tony, exactly. It's this sort of God's eye perspective on the history of the Vogons. So it's like we're not just asked, we're not just told about the Vogons and what happened. In a sense, what he does through his as if, right? Again, and notice the as if swears off any claim to truth, right? He's not saying this is what actually happened. He's saying it's as if that happened, right? But the whole point of making a comparison is in order to convey an idea. And so this is the idea that was so... Picture them, but in order to picture them properly, you have to imagine uh, a race of creatures so ugly, uh, so undesirable, so unpleasant... Uh, that they are, that the forces of, the disembodied forces of evolution themselves uh, personify themselves in their reaction, right? They turn aside in disgust and write them off. Um, so in swearing off any kind of, you know, truth claim, any kind of historical accuracy claim to that description, um, he prompts us to sort of dismiss the Vogons even more forcefully, right, than we would have done to, to sort of judge them, right, even more harshly than we might have done had he just told us what actually did happen during the course of their evolution or what sort of combination of evolutionary things led to this, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Yana, I think that the... the uh, the relationship I don't want to get into this because again to get into it is to like we need much more of the text than a couple references like this um, or like the Babelfish reference but let me just say the relationship between this text and atheism is a, an interesting and complex one let me just say that um, uh, yeah yeah, that's it. I, I'll just leave it there. Uh, it's interesting and complicated. Uh, but anyhow. Um, okay. So, but again, my question, who's the narrator? What is the, what is the relationship of the narrator to the story that he's telling? What is the relationship of the narrator to us? Right? What is the, what is the outer framework within which we're being asked to do all this shifting of focus from the earth and outwards, right? What is the, uh, uh, what is the, the sort of the top-down voice? What's he like? What's the narrator like um, as a character? What is the point of view of the narrator? Um, how can we understand that? Because one of the questions 
Um, one of the questions that I um, think is interesting for us to address, and this comes back to something I said last time and, and observations that several, several of you were making as we were talking about the first few paragraphs, one of the things that informs my desire to understand the narrator better is the question, what is the relationship between this book, which is called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and the book called The Hitchhiker's Galaxy, Guide to the Galaxy that is inside this book, right? Um, how closely connected are those two things? Um, as indeed several of you were suggesting, perhaps the narrator of the book is Ford Prefect or is some... Um, you know, it's like basically being told, in a sense, from a, uh, the, the uh, like, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide point of view. Possibly. Um, but I have to say, it's not that I think that that doesn't work entirely, um, but I get skeptical. Let's look at a few examples. Let's look at some, some Hitchhiker's Guide passages. Here's the Hitchhiker's Guide on the Vogon Constructor. This is the Vogon Constructor Fleet's entry. Here is what to do if you want to get a lift from a Vogon. Forget it. They are one of the most unpleasant races in the galaxy. Not actually evil, but bad-tempered, bureaucratic, officious, and callous. They wouldn't even lift a finger to save their own grandmothers from the ravenous bug-bladder beast of Trawl without orders signed in triplicate, sent in, sent back, queried, lost, found, subjected to public inquiry, lost again, and finally buried in soft peat for three months and recycled as fire lighters. The best way to get a drink out of a Vogon is to stick your finger down his throat, and the best way to irritate him is to feed his grandmother to the ravenous bug-bladder beast of Trawl. On no account allow a Vogon to read poetry at you. Arthur blinked at it. Now, um, I included that last bit. Um, Arthur blinked at it, right? Um, because I agree with Arthur. This description of Vogons makes me blink, too. The last one didn't, right? Um, I get this. It's funny, right? But I get this. Um, I, I, I can follow this. I don't understand about... I, I have no idea where Vogue Sphere is, right? But everything in this description, I get. Um, the as-if works. I mean, again, I think it's interesting to look at the as-if and how it's working and stuff, but, but it works, right? Um, when the guide talks about the Vogons... It, just, it takes lots of things for granted that the narrator generally doesn't in the same way, right? Um, now, I can kind of figure out what the ravenous bug bladder beast of Trawl is, right? Uh, but, um, uh, but I don't know what it is, right? This is not somebody that is trying, as the narrator was in that last passage, to work with my existing understandings in order to help me build in my own mind a conception of how horrible the Vogons are, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, James, that's a really great, uh, that's a really great point. Um, the second person is very characteristic here. Now, I'm not going to lean too heavily on that in the sense of, like, the, I mean, the fact that this is written in the second person, right, with all the yous, right, the, um, the best way, you know, to, for you to get a drink out of the Vogon is to stick your finger down his throat. Um, the fact that the narrator is not speaking in the second person, like, I mean, whatever, that could just be... It's a different. It's not actually the guide itself, right? So it's like it's sort of a different context. Um, I'm not. I'm not worried about that. Um, but yet, there seems to be a wider significance there, right? That is what the guide is attempting. I'm not convinced that what the narrator is trying to do is trying to accomplish is very much, is very similar to what the guide is trying to accomplish, right? Um, it 
you see what I mean by that? Again, comparing these two passages. The narrator is trying to help our imagination wrap itself grudgingly and uh, sort of cringingly around the Vogon concept, right? The, the attitude and approach of the guide is very different. It's not what it's trying to do. Um, it's practical, right? It's meant to be practical. Um, it's already assuming that we know lots of things, and it's true, um, Tom McCarthy, as you point out, if there, th- you know, if you don't know what the ravenous bug butter beast of troll is, you can look it up in the guide, right? So, uh, for that reason, the Hitchhiker's Guide is justified in taking more things for granted, right? Because you can always follow the thread. Um, but Jennifer, yes, exactly. Jennifer says the narrator is talking to us. The guide is talking to its galactic hitchhiking audience. And yes, Jennifer, th- to me, that's one of the most profound impacts of the you, right, of the second person in the Hitchhiker's Guide um, uh, passages, is that I feel excluded from the you, right? Um, the very fact that it keeps saying you reminds me that it's not talking to me, right? I don't want to get a lift from a Vogon, right? I don't want to get a drink out of a Vogon. Um, I'm certainly not going to stick my fingers down his throat, right? Um, and I would be frankly puzzled even if I were, uh, if anyone proposed that I should attempt to feed his grandmother to the rav- ravenous bug butter beast of troll. Um, and, but yet, Mike, I agree. You is friendly and chatty. It, it's, it's friendly, right? Like, you know, like the, like the font of the, of don't panic on the front cover. Um, I'm not saying that it's like snobbish or exclusionary. You're absolutely right, Mike. And that seems an important thing, right? Um, it's friendly and chatty and inclusive, and yet, I'm excluded, right? We're excluded. Um, let's look at some more examples. Arthur followed Ford's finger and saw where it was pointing. For a moment, it still didn't register. Then his mind nearly blew up. What? Harmless? Is that all it's got to say? Harmless? One word? Ford shrugged. Well, there are a hundred billion stars in the galaxy and only a limited amount of space in the book's microprocessors, he said. And no one knew much about the Earth, of course. Well, for God's sake, I hope you managed to rectify that a bit. Oh, yes. Well, I I managed to transmit a new entry off to the editor. He had to trim it a bit, but it's still an improvement. And what does it say now? asked Arthur. Mostly harmless, admitted Ford with a slightly embarrassed cough. Now, this, of course, is one of the classic lines of the entire book. Um... Uh, really wonderful, but again, illuminating of the overall tone of the guide itself, right? Um, The flippancy, right? The flippancy of uh, just having the word harmless and updating it to mostly harmless uh, I mean, this is, I agree, Glenn. It's, it is certainly, I mean, what, what's so funny is that it's, it's clearly accurate, right? To update it from harmless to mostly harmless. Uh, it's not an improvement in the sense of being more flattering to the earth, but it's definitely, um, uh, it's definitely more, uh, um, more accurate. Um, yeah, David, there seems to be, the, the Hitchhiker's Guide seems to be both, uh, a visual electronic text and an audio text, right? He's clearly listening to the um, to the entry on the Babelfish as they're passing through hyperspace, um, but he is um, clearly looking at it. Like, in, he's actually physically looking at the screen, and Ford points to the entry, right? Um, so, yeah, it, it does seem to be both. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um, Yana says, should we credit Adams with thinking of ebooks? You know, it is really funny. Um, nobody could call the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know, an attempt at really, like, penetrating, like, prognosticating science fiction, right? Except uh, Douglas Adams' anticipation of both 
ebooks, ebook readers, and the wiki, right? I mean, that's actually uh, there aren't too many. Uh, I mean, any serious, you know, sort of projecting science fiction writer who got that much right, I think, would be pretty proud of himself, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, James and Siri, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it is it is actually fairly remarkable, which in, in part, I think, for me, just kind of goes to show, uh, you know, you never know. <laughs> it's like, it's... it's uh, it's a fun game, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, um, but again, my point here is about the tone, the tone of the guide and not trying to judge it, you know, not trying to, to say whether it's good or bad, but just observing what it is. And what I keep finding is that I don't hear this. It's not that the narrator is serious, right? The narrator makes jokes, the narrator is, but it's not flippant in the same way, right? Uh, and the whole perspective and attitude seems to me to be a little bit different, right? Let's, um, let's keep going. Back to the narrator. So I've been talking about the, doing a, f a couple examples of the tone of the guide. Uh, back to the narrator. Ford, these are, uh, so the next two slides are the, uh, the footnotes. Um, that were in these chapters. Ford Prefect's original name is only pronounceable in an obscure Betelgeusean dialect, now virtually extinct since the great collapsing Hrung disaster of galactic sidereal year uh, 03758, which wiped out all the old Praxibetal communities on Betelgeuse 7. Ford's father was the only man on the entire planet to survive the great collapsing Hrung disaster by an extraordinary coincidence that he was never able satisfactorily to explain. The whole episode is shrouded in deep mystery. In fact, no one ever knew what a hrung was, nor why it had chosen to collapse on Betelgeuse 7 particularly. Ford's father, magnanimously waving aside the clouds of suspicion that had inevitably settled around him, came to live on Betelgeuse 5, where he both fathered and uncled Ford. In memory of his now dead race, he christened him in the ancient Praxibetal tongue. Because Ford never learned to say his original name, his father eventually died of shame, which is still a terminal disease in some parts of the galaxy. The other kids at school nicknamed him Ix, which, in the language of Betelgeuse 5, tra translates as boy who is not able satisfactorily to explain what a hrung is, nor why it should choose to collapse on Betelgeuse 7. Um, so now, as I said, obviously, the t it's not that the tone of the narrator uh, is always serious, right? Clearly not always serious. Um, the sort of ironical uh, and sort of satirical comments about Ford's father, right? My favorite line being magnanimously waving aside the clouds of suspicion, right? It's the word magnanimously that does it. Um, it would be one thing for him to wave aside the clouds of suspicion and boldly, bravely going on living his life despite the suspicion, right? That would be sort of admirable. Um, it's magnanimously, that's the kicker, right? Um, so I, I really, uh, I really like that. Um, uh, yeah, and Yana, I, the, the, uh, uh, the philological joke at the end there is really funny, right? That, you know, the idea that the, the, the two letter name X, you know, translates as that whole sentence, um, uh, which of course is often a kind of thing that happens, right? When there's like an idiomatic sort of association with a word in one language and in order to convey what that word means in the other language, you have to use a whole bunch of words for it. Um, you know, that kind of experience is fairly common. This is, uh, you know, obviously a very funny exaggeration of that, uh, of that, of that tendency. Um, but, um, but again, so what else do you notice about, um, about the, the narrator here? First, let's talk about the context of this passage. The fact that the narrator chooses to include footnotes. That's an interesting point. Um, and it's one of the things that you can tell when, when a narrator starts giving notes, starts framing a thing in notes, um, they're taking a particular approach. They're sort of betraying a particular approach. If you're putting in footnotes, 
it means you care, right? That is, you feel the need to explain the fact that you've shoved that explanation into a footnote instead of including it in the body of the text is an acknowledgement of the fact that this explanation is a little bit tangential, right? It's not actually a sense, not really a part of what I'm talking about here, but so I'm not going to just interrupt everything and, and stop what I'm saying in order to give you these two paragraphs in the midst of the text. And yet, I think it's important enough to explain this fact that I want to step in and, and, and tell you. I want to step in and give it to you, right? Um, so, for instance, just to make one really small... And I, this is, I shouldn't do this because I, I, I uh, am breaking a rule. I said we're going to talk about the radio series later on, so I've been trying not to talk about the radio series. But I will. Just very briefly. No explanation like that is ever given. Ford Prefect is just called Ford Prefect, and we're not given his real name, at least not during the parts of the story which are turned into this book. Um, The point is simply that explanatory impulse, right? Um is part of the narrator's thing, right? Um, and I think that's uh, um, that seems to be an important element of the character of the narrator. Um, I don't know if you're accustomed to thinking of narrators as sort of independent characters. I think it was I think it was my experience going through in my PhD program, like basically spending several years. Um, uh, like basically as like Chaucer's roommate, you know, <laughs> like living with Chaucer for, for a bunch of years trained me to think of narrators as characters, right? To, to sort of, ign- that you know, the, obviously the many different levels in which he does that in the Canterbury Tales, not only because you have, you know, the whole story is about a group of storytellers and narrators, right? Who then tell stories. So you have the stories about the people and then the stories that the people tell and the relationship between the stories that they tell and the stories that in the characters that we meet, you know, right. But then of course you get the character of the guy who's narrating the story of the storytellers going along. So he's sort of maximally playing with those different levels of narration in the Canterbury tales, though, even in his other works from his very first, um, uh, you know, long narrative poem from the Book of the Duchess. He's, you know, he, the narrator, is the first person character in the story, and he's playing with a lot of those things. Um, anyway, I so I can't help it, but but uh, sort of ask those questions and 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 at least sort of check. Sometimes, of course, it doesn't always work. It's not always true that the narrator of the story really functions and exists as a separate character. But there are enough things in this book that kind of nudge me into those directions, you know, that, uh, that lead me to, um, at least suspect that th- there's a, partially it's the voice, right? It's such a very distinctive voice for this narrator, um, that it, it, it just feels like a person, uh, much more so than merely a, a sort of disembodied and omniscient perspective on the story. Um, anyway, let's look at, uh, the other footnote example. The term imperial is kept, though it is now an anachronism. This is, of course, part of the footnote on uh, uh, imperial galactic, or in, in president of the imperial galactic government. That's it, right? The term imperial is kept, though it is now an anachronism. The hereditary emperor is nearly dead and has been for many centuries. In the last moments of his dying coma, he was locked in a stasis field, which keeps him in a state of perpetual unchangingness. All his heirs are now long dead, and this means that without any drastic political upheaval, power has simply and effectively moved a rung or two down the ladder, and is now seen to be vested in a body that used to act simply as advisors to the emperor, an elected governmental assembly headed by a president-elect of that assembly. In fact... It vests in no such place. The president in particular is very much a figurehead. He wields no real power whatsoever. He is apparently chosen by the government, but the qualities he is required to display are not those of leadership, but of finely judged outrage. For this reason, the president is always a controversial choice, always an infuriating but fascinating character. His job is not to wield power, but to draw attention away from it. On those criteria, Zephon Bibelbrox is one of the most successful presidents the galaxy has ever had. 
he has already spent two of his ten presidential years in prison for fraud. Very, very few people realize that the president and the government have virtually no power at all, and of these few people, only six know whence ultimate political power is wielded. Most of the others secretly believe that the ultimate decision-making process is handled by a computer. They couldn't be more wrong. What do you make of this? What do you make of, of again, the tone? Uh, my focus here is not on Zephod Bibelbrox, right? My focus is on the narrator, right? Um, uh, it's uh, actually, Tony, these, uh, the footnotes are not left out of the audiobook. Um, but, at least not the Stephen Fry recording, but when Stephen Fry does them, like all of this text is in Stephen Fry's reading. He doesn't clearly signal what's footnote and what isn't. Um, I have to admit that I was, when I was looking through the text, I was kind of surprised. I, I forget which one of it it was. I think it was, um, it was, it was the Ford Prefect's name. I didn't get, when I was listening to the audiobook, I didn't get that it was a footnote. Um, uh, I kind of like, like for instance, the footnotes in, um, uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell are much more clearly signaled. They're still read, right? But uh, but there's a much clearer signal that this is a footnote that you're reading. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, but they, they are they 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 are definitely there. Um, what do we learn? What do we learn about the narrator? <laughs> Stephen, I wondered. I wondered if anybody was gonna was gonna make a joke about that. Stephen Cover says, "I thought supreme executive power derived from a mandate from the masses." Um, you know, Stephen, I actually think that the tone of the humor um, in that uh, you know the the um, that the peasant scene in um, in in the Holy Grail is very similar. Actually, I think it, it would be a really interesting comparison between the tone of the narrator in uh, uh, in this, you know, in the Hitchhiker's Guide, especially like in moments like this. Uh, and uh, and I, th there's actually, I think there's some, I think there's some real meat there. Actually, um, yeah, <laughs> of course, you're right. There is a farcical aquatic ceremony going on here too, isn't there? Um, first, I talked about the explanatory impulse. Once again, we're getting a footnote. We're getting a much longer footnote, right? Um, and uh, the tone of this footnote is very expository, right? Um, when I was reading this, be honest now, when I was reading that, did at any point your eyes start to roll back in your head? Because mine kind of do, even when Stephen Fry reads it, right? Who is much better at reading it than I am. And for that reason, especially the, like, when we get into the first paragraph, um, power has simply and effectively moved a rung or two down the ladder and is now seen to be vested in a body that used to act simply as advisors to the emperor, an elected governmental assembly headed by a president, right? I mean, are you lost? I'm like, oh man, it's gotten so boring, right? And to me, the turning point, where I start losing it, where I start wandering off when I'm listening to that or reading it, is the word vested. As soon as he says, a uh, you know, effectively moved a rung or two down the ladder, I'm still with him, right? And is now seen to be vested in a body, and I'm like, ooh, vested in a body, right? Um, but then he plays on that, right? And again, when I, and I, I always notice this when I'm listening to the Stephen Fry recording, when he comes to the end of the paragraph, and Stephen Fry does a really good job of emphasizing it, right? In fact, it vests in no such place. Uh, and the repetition of the boring word vest and the tone of that sentence as if like he's pulling out something super exciting, right? In fact, it vests in no such place. Um, the use of... People very rarely use the verb vest 
in the present tense. Is seen to be vested in a body. That's the way it's normally used, right? Um, but to talk about something vesting in the present tense, right? As if this were a really delicious kind of secret or insight, right? Um, uh, like we're being let in on something super cool is is kind of fun. So he, the narrator has that explanatory impulse and is kind of a dork, but he's also a very well-informed dork. Uh, the very fact that he can tell us that there are only six people who know whence ultimate political power is wielded is important, right? Because our narrator is therefore claiming, if not to be one of the six, at least he knows that there are six it's not even obvious that all six of the people who do know necessarily know all the other, you know, know the other five, right? But he, the narrator, knows exactly how many of them there are, right? Um, and uh, he even knows the false assumption that most everybody else makes, right? So uh, most people believe that the president and the government actually rule. Right? Very few people realize that that's not true. Of those few, most of those few believe that the decision making process is handled by a computer. They couldn't be more wrong. But of course, you notice the other big thing, right? What's the other major factor from this section? He never tells us! Right? We never, le we never learn. So. Where is the ultimate decision-making process handled, right? Where, in fact, does the authority vest? He doesn't tell us, right? He doesn't tell us why he can't tell us. Uh, he shouldn't have told us. I mean, if he's revealed this much already, like, how much more harm could he do? Um, but again, this 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 is this helps me to round out the character of the narrator, right? To to understand it better. Um, he knows a lot. He lo he wants he likes to explain things. He wants us to understand, uh, and his uh, and he knows a lot, but he's not gonna he's not gonna tell us everything. And I Arthur, I don't rule out the fact that he's just having us on. Right, um, that he might not know at all, or even possibly that he might be making this up. Though certainly the tone of these two paragraphs sounds quite earnest, right, um, and has that kind of insider flavor. Right, we're being led in on the inside, which can remember the context, what we started talking about. Right, um, the Earth is gone. We're now at large in a galaxy that we've never seen and know nothing else about. Um, our uh, parochial viewpoint in which we consider the Earth to be everything that matters has been forcibly removed by the destruction of the Earth, right? Um, and what do we get from the narrator in the very next chapter? I'll tell you the inside scoop about how the galaxy really works that only six other people in the entire galaxy even know. Right? And isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting that that's the angle that the narrator, that the book, tells us? Right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and Ollie, I do think that this is satire of politics at large. Um, and I think that it's not only satire of politics at large, I think it's satire of people who are interested in politics. If our ears do perk up at the sentence, in fact, it vests in no such place, right? If our response to that is to be like, ooh, yeah, tell me where the power vests, right? The joke's going to be on us because we're not going to be told where the power vests, right? Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's I, I so I think it it's 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 kind of having fun with that whole uh, thing in in a couple different ways, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I 
<laughs> it's still true. Yeah, uh, Arthur and uh, uh, Mike earlier on, Mike Moore earlier on, were pointing out, you, did everybody see that we actually have 42 attendees tonight? <laughs> in a, it's true. Can't make this stuff up. Uh, there are 42 people in the webinar tonight. Um, Mike had pointed out that earlier. I, I, th I figured it would change. It's still true. An hour and a half into class. Um, anyway, okay. So let's keep going. Because we need to get to Vogon poetry. Transitioning into Vogon poetry, let's look at the narrator's introduction to the poetic lowerarchy. Vogon poetry is, of course, the third worst in the universe. Think about the effect of that phrase, of course. Right? Think about the relationship between us and the narrator. Think about the attitude of the narrator towards himself. That is, all of those things implied by the use of the phrase, of course, in that first sentence. Right? Vogon poetry is, of course, the third worst in the universe. The second worst is that of the Asgoths of Kriya. During a recitation by their poet-master Grunthos the Flatulent of his poem Ode to a Small Lump of Green Putty I Found in My Armpit One Midsummer Morning, four of his audience died of internal hemorrhaging, and the president of the Mid-Galactic Arts Nobbling Council survived by gnawing one of his own legs off. <laughs> I love the fact that, of course, gnawing your leg, uh, surviving by gnawing your own leg off is something that you do if you're caught in a trap, <laughs> right? And yet, so we're, we're given this, this, this image as if we're to imagine that, like, the poetry, <laughs> the poetry reading itself, like the poetry of Poet Master Grunthos is like a bear trap, cla <laughs> you know, uh, clamped on your ankle, uh, both in its painfulness and in, uh, you know, the fact that it's ultimately going to lead you uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to a slow, painful death or possibly self-destruction. But the even funnier thing, so it, it conveys that image, right? But then the even funnier thing is the fact that, uh, you know, he, the, the, there's the, he's not in a trap, actually. He's just gnawing his own leg off. Because <laughs> he's not being held by the leg. He's just gnawing his own leg off. And by that, surviving. So it's like the, the very, like the pain experienced uh, by gnawing his own leg off was... Uh, it's like so much more pleasant by contrast. Like it, the the excruciating pain of gnawing his leg off drowned was the only thing that was sufficient uh, to uh, to 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 exceed in magnitude the sense the sense the sensuous experience of listening to the poem. And it was so much more pleasant to gnaw his own leg off that it enabled him to survive. He survived that, but he might not have survived the other. Uh, I just I just love that. Um, I also love, of course, the implied, um, the, the, notice the, the implication of the title of his poem, right? Uh, the, like, what makes his poetry such bad, but we're not given, fortunately, I think, as we don't want anyone to gnaw their limbs off, uh, in order to attempt to survive, so we're not given any extracts from, uh, the, this memorable ode. Um, but we can tell by the title what it's like, right? We can tell by the title um, what kind of poetry it is. Like, um, thinking of that uh, that wonderful phrase that I've quoted so often from C.S. Lewis, wherein does its badness consist, right? We can tell wherein the badness of the poetry of Poet Master Grunthos the Flatulent consists, right? Um, extreme, uh, uh, Mike, as you say, narcissism, right? Extreme self-focus, right? I'm going to write a poem... Uh, about something that happened on a midsummer morning, which makes it sound like it's going to be, you know, like a nice, uh, pleasant thing, except it's just about him, except it's just about his own body, right? Except it's just about a small lump of green putty I found in my armpit one midsummer morning. So, um, something sort of especially, uh, especially disgusting. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Arthur, thinking about the uh, the gnawing off of his own leg, Arthur says that uh, apparently uh, as gothic poetry is kind of like the Gom Jabbar. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, 
Yeah, <laughs> that's good, actually, yeah. Uh, Carolyn Morehouse says that uh, uh, Bigwig seems to have had a similar kind of reaction to Silverweed's poem. Uh, so did Fiverr, in a sense, though, I mean, he got it. But, uh, uh, but yeah, he reacted like he was in a snare, didn't he? Um, yeah, yeah, good. Oh, uh, Arthur, that was uh, David Attlee's suggestion about the Gom Jabbar. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great observation. Um, yeah, yeah, cool. Um I will keep going. Grunthos is reported to have been disappointed by the poem's reception and was about to embark on a reading of his 12 book epic entitled My Favorite Bath Time Gurgles when his own major intestine, in a desperate attempt to save life and civilization, leaped straight up through his neck and throttled his brain. Um, notice again, right? Notice again the implication of some kind of like that that the the large intestine right of the poet has an altruistic motivation right and uh, and sets and acts in this uh i i presume generally uncharacteristic way uh in a desperate attempt to save life and civilization um uh but um Anyway, yeah, Ian, I agree. It's this is it's it's, it's very very vivid imagery. Um, and by the way, that line has always been one of my favorite. That that sentence, uh, that last sentence, which is of course a nice uh, uh, classic long Adams-ish sentence. Um, uh, yeah, so the sentence about the 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 major intestine of Grunthos, the flatulent, uh, is uh, always been one of my favorite in the book. Um, yeah, Arthur, it does give a new meaning to toxic megacolon. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Toxic megacolon uh, being an actual uh, and quite horrible uh, medical condition. Um, uh, Arthur, there was actually um, uh, a couple of uh, the med students in my wife's class actually had a band which they called Toxic Megacolon, which is a pretty good band name, you have to admit. Um, <laughs> but anyway... Okay, the very worst poetry of all perished along with its creator, Paula Nancy Millstone Jennings of Greenbridge, Essex, England, in the destruction of planet Earth. Um, and uh, uh, Lance, you're right. Uh, the, the fact that uh, poetry even worse than that existed on the planet Earth could by itself explain the upgrading of Earth from harmless to mostly harmless. Um, but uh, this, is, uh, this is, of course, classic. Notice that we're told nothing about her poetry, right? We, we, we at least get the titles of the two poems of Poet Master Grunthos, right? Um, uh, but we get nothing other than her name, which sounds so innocuous. Paula Nancy Millstone Jennings, right? Um, of Greenbridge, Essex, England. So, um, so unassuming, right? Uh, and yet the the way again, it's like Vogon facial features, right? We're just our imagination is just let go, right? So imagining that Paula, it's that a, a a woman or a girl named Paula Nancy Millstone Jennings, uh, whose poetry was worse than the poetry that led somebody's large in, or that led the poet's own large intestine uh, to leap up and strangle him, um, is. Uh, uh, is kind of wonderful. And, uh, and so Ian, but you notice that's kind of interesting, right? That yes, of course, the, um, um, the, the recollection of her poetry has died with the earth, except of course, for our narrator who knows about it. Right. Um, so our narrator through telling us this is keeping alive in a sense, at least in sort of rumor, the poetic legacy of Paul and Nancy Millstone Jennings, which is a superlative legacy. Uh, even though horrifying. Um, and, um, um, but in addition, you notice what this Paul and Nancy Millstone Jennings is a foil, right? Um, she's a person about whom we know a name and nothing else except that we're told about she, like, the worst poetry in the entire universe, which was fortunately destroyed, right, with the whole earth. Remember the woman who found the 
you know, the answer to life, the universe, and everything, right? Who figured out how to how to fix everything and make everything better? Uh, who also lived in a specific in a, in, in a similarly particular and specific English neighborhood, right? English town. Um, and I don't think if are we told her name? I'm forgetting now. Are we told the name of the girl who figured out the answer to life? Somebody remind me if we are or not. Um, but, you know, we're not. Okay, good. I didn't think so. So there we're told what her idea was, but we're not given her name. Here we're given Paul and Nancy Millstone Jennings' name, but we're not told. Um, we're, not, we're not given details, again, other than the one, the one big fact. And yet the two of them, the two of them fit together. Right, the two of them kind of... So, the destruction of the Earth was a, was a, a terrible, stupid catastrophe, right? Because of the, distru- you know, the death of this girl before he could, she could tell anybody about you know, the answer, uh, the solution to all of the problems. But then again, it also brought to an end the worst poetry in the history of the universe. So, you know, it's a wash, I guess. Yeah. Uh, good. Several of you are pointing to uh, her being a character later on. Yeah. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to get into it now. But 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 yeah yeah yeah. Um, okay. With that, let's transition into Vogon poetry. The prisoners sat in poetry appreciation chairs, strapped in. Vogon suffered no illusions as to the regard their works were generally held in. Their early attempts at composition had been part of a bludgeoning insistence that they be accepted as a properly evolved and cultured race. But now the only thing that kept them going was sheer bloody-mindedness. The sweat stood out cold on Ford Prefect's brow and slid round the electrodes strapped to his temples. These were attached to a battery of electronic equipment, imagery intensifiers, rhythmic modulators, alliterative residulators, and simile dumpers, all designed to heighten the experience of the poem and make sure that not a single nuance of the poem's thought was lost. Um... I want one. <laughs> I want a poetry appreciation chair. Uh, I, I, I see. I feel like if I could strap more of my students into poetry appreciation chairs, it would just make things so much easier, right? Uh, I would love to be able to uh, to get some imagery intensifiers going, right? Uh, some rhythmic modulators, right? Make sure that not a single nuance of the poet's thought was lost. This sounds this sounds like a great idea. Yeah, Ollie was anticipating that. I totally wish I had those. Uh, that sounds great, though. Of course, it's they're being used for evil and not for good here. Um, the only thing that kept them going was sheer bloody mindedness. Um, another classic Adams-ish end to a sentence, right? Um, yeah. Uh, Yeah, no, Takako, I wouldn't apply it to the Vogon poetry. Um, but, um, but yeah, yeah, I, uh, I would certainly like to heighten the experience of poetry uh, for listeners. Uh, but I love the fact that, of course, this is for them. These are, in, these are instruments of torture. Um, notice the shift in the tone. The sweat stood out cold on Ford Prefect's brow and slid round the electrodes strapped to his temples. That's a great sentence, right? Very much not in keeping with the tone of the sentences around it. Um, So we get this combination of uh, the, the comical sentences describing the thing at the expense of the Vogons and the very serious and dramatic description of uh, of Ford's um, of Ford's situation. Rachel, yes, Arthur is strapped into another device, uh, a, a similar device. The only difference is he doesn't know what to expect or what the chair does. Uh, so he's not afraid. Uh, Vogon hasn't started reading his poetry yet. Uh, so it's only Ford Prefect that is su- suffering acutely because he is suffering anticipation of what he knows uh, is going to be coming. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly, Carolyn. I would use poetry appreciation chairs on on uh, on people who tell folks to skip the poems in the Lord of the Rings. I totally would. 
and now the poem itself. Oh, freddled grunt bugly, he began. Spasms racked Ford's body. This was worse than even he'd been prepared for. Thy micturations are to me as plurtled gabble blotchets on a lurgid bee. Ah! went Ford Prefect, wrenching his head back as lumps of pain thumped through it. He could dimly see beside him Arthur lolling and rolling in his seat. He clenched his teeth. Group, I implore thee, continued the merciless Vogon, my fronting turling drones. His voice was rising to a horrible pitch of impassioned stridency. And hoopsiously drangle me with crinkly bindle wordles, or I will rend thee in the gobber warts with my blurdle crunchin'. See if I don't. See if I don't is my favorite line uh, <laughs> in the poem. Um, let's do some analysis here. Uh, first of all, I have no idea why there's a question mark at the beginning of this second bit. Um, is that a convention that I'm not understanding? Um, or what? Because I, uh, I don't think I get it. Um, are we supposed to imagine that Although, you know, we've paused for a description of the spasms wrecking Ford's body. Um, I, uh, um, so am I supposed to understand that the first line of the poem is, O freddled grunt bugly, thy micturations are to me, as, pl as plurled gabble blotchets on a lurgid bee? I think so, because that actually scans, right? Um... O freddled grunt bugly, thy micturations are to me as plurtled gabble blotchets on a lurgid bee. So yeah, it must be continuous. Um, why the question mark is there, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's what I'm wondering. You know, uh, several people were wondering about um, uh, whether or not it suggests that there's a word missing there. I don't think so. Or, I mean, maybe like maybe the fact that the lines seem to scan is evidence that there should be something in there because it shouldn't scan. Um, now, most of this poem consists of nonsense words. This is important, considering the fact that this is very recently after... Arthur's had the Babelfish put in his ear, right? We've just been treated earlier in this chapter, or the chapter before, anyway, quite recently, right, to the experience of him listening to uh, the Vogon speaking, you know, to this Vogon speaking in his own language, which, like, snarl, gurgle, gurgle, snarl, right? Um, and then it resolves into English, and now it's resolving back into not quite gurgle, gurgle, snarl, howl, howl, gurgle, um, but something that is little removed from that, right? Um, we, so again, it's interesting, right? It's interesting that when he's speaking poetically, that is, we may be tempted when reading the Vogon poem to think... But wait, of course, freddled grunt bugly probably makes sense to Vogons. It just doesn't matter. How, how should we expect it to make sense to us? Because our vocabulary isn't the same. But no, it should. There are no other examples of post-Babelfish words spoken by the Vogons that are not understood, that are not rendered into comprehensible English. That's what the Babelfish does, right? Um... So, um, yeah, David Attlee is wondering, are there Vogon idioms that don't, um, uh, that don't translate? Uh, possibly, but again, it's not an idiom thing, exactly. Um, it's a vocabulary thing. It's the words sound like nonsense, which they shouldn't, um, unless... They are, in fact, nonsense words, right? That it seems to be, in fact, a poem, um, a poem 
that is uh, consisting self-consciously of nonsense words. Um, Jennifer, I also was thinking that maybe the poetry is so bad the Babel fish is glitching out. Um, that also does seem uh, seem possible. Um, uh, yeah, Tom McCarthy is suggesting that maybe um, just, there are no words in any non vogonic language um, that like, you just it's untranslatable because of course poetry right it's that like you can't really translate poetry into another language maybe even the it's beyond perhaps maybe even the babel fish but um, I I don't think so I don't think so I think these are nonsense words on purpose. As I don't think this is a failure to translate. I think this is an effective translation of Vogon phrasing, right? Um, there are a couple jokes here, right? One is... Okay, there are many jokes here. Um, two words jump out at me in particular as words which either sound like nonsense words but aren't, or don't sound like nonsense words but are, right? Uh, the first is micturations. Now, if you... Putting micturations in amongst freddled, plurdled, lurgid, and turling drones, right? It sounds like a nonsense word. But it's not a nonsense word. Thy micturations... A, a micturation, it means... Yeah, Arthur, I knew you would know this one. Uh, my wife knew it too. Um, it's uh, it 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 means urination. Um, it's actually there's a further joke because if I'm if I'm correct about this, uh, and physicians in the house correct me if I'm wrong, it's spelled wrong. It's micturition with an I instead of an A, isn't it? Isn't it the correct term micturition? Um, but micturation is a common error that it's micturation is it is is a, a a word in use but it's a word in use that originates from a an error just like a spelling and pronunciation error of micturition but it means urination so he's, so thy micturations are to me he's talking about the urine of whomever he's addressing right uh so i i, I really like the fact that amidst all of those nonsense words is smuggled a non a, a highly obscure and technical but non nonsense word, which is, um, uh, uh, what's that phrase with the drinking game? Um, I forget the adverb. Something biological. The game that Ford Prefect usually plays to lose with the jank spirits. Um, obscenely biological. Is that the... I'm, I'm forgetting. Somebody remind me of the correct adverb there. Um, but anyway, um, it's, 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 the, the, that, that one word in there is uh, 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 obscenely. It is obscenely, yeah. Obscenely biological. Um, so that's, that's, that's great. That's funny. The other thing, uh, the, the other word that jumps out at me that I would draw attention to is group. G-R-O-O-P. This is the one which is a nonsense word, but sounds like it isn't. Again, listening to the audiobook, I didn't catch that. Group, I implore thee. That kind of makes sense. All of a sudden, right? Of all the other things he said, nothing has really made sense. Um, group, I implore thee. Makes it sound like G-R-O-U-P. Like, uh, you know, speaking to a group of people and calling them group is not very interesting, um, but at least it's sensical, Right? Um, and yet it's not. It's either a nonsense word or, yeah, David, it's also possibly a proper noun. Um, but again, it sounds like it makes sense, but it actually doesn't make the sense that you think it makes, right? Also, fronting, right? Fronting is another, it's like, it's almost a word, but it's not quite. Of course, another word that I am interested in is be, right? Um, as plurled gabble blotchets on a lurgid be, all of a sudden I get a noun that I understand, right? Um, and that combination, uh, that combination of, uh, an adjective that I don't understand with a noun that I do 
is a really attractive combination. And Stephen, I have to admit, the more I was sitting here and thinking about the Vogon poem, the more often I had to Google these words because I was like, I'm like, wait a second. Like, Lurgid isn't actually a word, is it? Because I mean, I was, Stephen, I was having the same effect, uh, the, the, same, the same reaction. I'm like, that sounds like, I think I know what a Lurgid bee is like, right? I think I get it. Um, and, um, and, uh, no, no, it's, it's not in fact a real word, but there are a bunch of plausible, almost words, right? Plurtled, uh, is like several words, but it's not exactly like either one. Lurgid, again, I feel like it conveys something, but I'm not sure what it is. Um, drangle, right? Um, uh, Blurgle crunching. <laughs> Sorry, there's something so intrinsically amusing about the the about crunching, right? Um, as uh, you know that that combination of crunch and luncheon, or crunch and trunching, right? Uh, uh, it's just, uh, and then you combine it with blurgle, and it's just a fantastic word, right? I mean, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't get away from it. Um, um, so. Um, yeah, and I, I can see, of course, the vast majority of you are thinking in exactly the same directions that I could not help but think um, when I was when it, when I was uh, really sort of reading and thinking about this poem, and that is, of course, thinking about Lewis Carroll, um, who is the the most effective and most famous uh, nonsense poetry writer. Uh, in recent times. Uh, so I took the liberty of uh, putting up a comparison here. Of course, from Jabberwocky, his most famous nonsense poem. "'Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the mome wraths outgrabe. And as in... Uh, and I'm skipping a bit, of course. I couldn't put the whole paragraph. The, and besides which, boy, if I put the entire poem in this slide, just imagine how distracted I would get. Uh, this is me trying not to do a line-by-line -line analysis of Jabberwocky. And as in... Uh, you have to vote in through the looking glass in order for us to do that. If we do that, I will. And as in uffish thought he stood, the Jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the Tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. Notice how this poem works. Uh, remember the comment that Alice makes in the book after she reads this poem. She reads the poem and says, This poem seems to fill my head... It fills my head with ideas, but I don't know what they are. Right? Uh, and I love that description of the effect of these words. That's exactly the effect that I feel, too. Um, it's not so much... When I hear these lines, I do not feel that I am, in general, receiving nonsense. The first stanza, which is, of course, repeated at the end, is where I'm closest to that. Right? "'Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimbal in the wabe. All mimsy were the bora groves, and the mome wraths outgrabe." There's very little for us to um, hold on to here, right? Um, there's almost nothing. There's n adjective... There's neither adjective, noun, nor active verb um, that really we know what it means, right? We are almost entirely reference, frame of reference free in that first stanza. Fortuitously, of course, that's the stanza that Humpty Dumpty explains for us later in the story. But, um, uh, uh, yeah, and Mike, I absolutely love the, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, Gary Gygax put uh, Vorpal Blades, uh, which can, uh, whose special property is to decapitate things, um, which still exists in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, by the way, uh, as well as Jabberwocks in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Monster's Manual. Anyway, yeah, uh, the Monster's Compendium, of course, as it was in the first edition. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's lovely. Um, but focus on, so we get those the, the, the sort of more like pure nonsense of that first stanza, but that's not mostly how the poem works, right? Um, 
those the next two stanzas that I quoted there are much more typical for how the poem actually works. Look at that second stanza that I have there. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. The total number of nonsense words, now I'm not even going to count jabberwock, because although we don't know in general what a jabberwock is, it's what the thing is called, right? So, you know, it's kind of... Uh, I'm a little iffy on calling that... Um, of... Um, uh, calling that uh, a nonsense word exactly. It kind of is, but it's not the same as the rest of them. Um, uh, anyway, so uffish, right? As in uffish thought he stood, whiffling, tulgy, and burble. There's really four primary uh, nonsense words in that whole stanza. and But yet, all of them manage to convey something, right? Um, whiffling. It came whiffling through the wood, right? I get that. It's almost onomatopoetic, right? With the, the rushing of wind in its sp- in the speed of its coming, right? So I, th- onomatopoeia helps me with that. Burbled, right? Okay, like again, it's close enough to some words that I know that I, I, can, I have something to, uh, to latch on to, right? Told G. Okay, right? Again, I don't really know what that means at all, but I do feel like came whiff- whiffling through the told G wood kind of kind of helps me right I mean I, I get offish thought I love that I often stand in offish thought uh, that I that 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 works um, it's the wonderful and of course the really lovely thing about a bunch of words at this poem it's not just you know Mike was talking about Dungeons and Dragons and the uh, the way in which this was incorporated, you know, the, that those elements were incorporated into the game. But of course, there's also the things that the the words in this poem that were incorporated into mainstream language. The word chortled, for instance, is used as a nonsense word in this poem. The word chortled doesn't make any more sense than burbled, tulgy, or uffish, and yet that word be- it's now a word. Right, it's now a legit word, but you go look it up in the OED, and you'll find its first usage is in the poem Jabberwocky. Right, he made it up. It was as much a nonsense word as any of the rest of them. Burbled is not a real word, or at least it wasn't until this poem. Uh, burbled is another word, which like you can you galumphing, right? Galumphing. How how um how evocative is the word galumphing? He went galumphing back, right? But that's not a word. It's similarly a complete nonsense word. Um. So, and, and Mike, I agree, the nonsense verbs are the funniest. I find them, I find them so, too. Uh, by the way, this is where I, uh, um, uh, my fantasy football team has been named the Slithy Toves for many years. Um, it also enables me to say, oh, frabjous day, kalu kale, if ever I win my, uh, my league, which doesn't happen that often. Um, but, uh, Jennifer, this is why I was, uh, I was amused when you said, oh, frabjous day, kalu kale at the beginning of the class. I was like, ah, yeah, we're going to talk about Jabberwocky, as you probably guessed we would. Um, oh, Tony, I forgot about that. Uh, Tony recalls that J.K. Rowling used the word galumphing to describe Vernon Dursley. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's very evocative, even though hard to define, because it's nonsense. Anyway, point is... The Vogon poem seems to be doing similar kinds of things, right? You can clearly see a. This is why, um, this is why I believe that this is not a failure to translate, because the nonsense words that we are getting through the Babelfish here, uh, many of them seem to function, right? Lurju is a ve- that's a very Carol esque nonsense word. The similarity to turgid, right? Though it doesn't mean exact, it doesn't mean the same thing. Um, but again, it's close enough that we can. It's like a, a cousin of turgid, so we have some kind of vague associations with it. Though in context, I can't understand at all what it means. Plurled, right? Sounds like curdled, uh, but uh, isn't right. Um, so there's a bunch of words which work sort of similarly, right? Um, drangle, right? Um, uh, but then we have all these other words which may be similarly effective but are horrible. That is, uh, 
I my mind actively shrinks back from closer contemplation of the word grunt bugly. I, I can't. I won't. I refuse. Like, my brain uh, uh, shudders back in horror at the prospect of really thinking about that. Um, uh, I don't want to know what somebody's gobber warts are. Um, I don't want to think about a bindle wordle or why it's crinkly. Um, I'm afraid to envision a blurgle crunching, right? And this seems to me uh, to be a a nod to the level, like, to why is Vogon poetry so bad? Again, wherein does the badness of Vogon poetry consist? It doesn't consist merely in, like, bad meter, right? Like I said, those first two lines scan. O freddled grunt bugly thy micturations are to me as plurdled globble blotchets on a lurgid bee. Right, listen to that. That works, right? Um, now it, it loses it and that's why See If I Don't uh, is so funny, right? Or I will rend thee in the gobber warts with my blunger crunch, with my blurgle crunching. See If I Don't, right? Uh, the completely unnecessary arrhythmic um, addition of See If I Don't at the end. Um, the fact that it has established some kind of a rhythmic pattern in those first two lines. And then it loses it. Okay, so let's, let's listen. Okay. O freddled grunt bugly, thy micturations are to me, as plurdled gabble blotchets on a lurgid bee. Group, I implore thee, my fronting turling drums, and hoopsiously drangle me with crinkly bingle wordles. We're losing it already, but it's not totally lost. Until, or I will rend thee in the gobber warts with my blurgle crunching. See if I don't. Right? The entire rhythmic concept unravels at the end. Right now, that's fairly bad, um, but that's not really quite enough to make it the third worst in the universe, right? But then, when you add the the effect of the nonsense words, right? And see, this is um, this is to me what's interesting about this. Vogon poetry is bad, not because it's incompetent but because it works. It's successful. Remember the joke I made in my Exploring the Hobbit book about uh, Bilbo's first ever venture into uh, poetic composition being in the genre of spider aggravation poetry, right? And the narrator apologizes that the that Bilbo's spider songs are not very good, perhaps, right? Um, and yet perfectly effective, right? They had exactly the effect on his intended audience that he was going for. Uh, so, um, quite, uh, 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 quite effective, right? It, it accomplished its goal, and so how could you possibly say that it needs apologizing for? Vogon poetry is kind of like that, actually, right? Um, what keeps them going? Why does, uh, uh, why does the Vogon poet compose sheer bloody mindedness right out of the desire to inflict pain and suffering on others and it works again like i i i am sure i am sure that if i were strapped into a poetry appreciation chair the word grunt bugly would have me you know writhing and screaming along with ford prefect um and uh, you're right, Mike. Lurgid bees may perhaps be dis distantly related to adder cops. You can't rule it out. Um, and so, yes, Jennifer, you're right. We are being effectively introduced to the Vogon mindset. And it's terrible. It's horrifying. But again, effective, right? I mean, it works. It accomplishes its end. And that, to me, is a really, in really kind of interesting joke. Um, it's a bad poem, 
But not in the sense of being merely incompetent. Again, we, we do get the sort of metrical collapse at the end. Um, and the, the sort of the subjugation of the of the, the the rhythm of the actual poetic form to the the like desire to express spitefulness. See if I don't, right? Um, but but again, it's not the badness of it is not a badness of structure. It's not a badness of form. It's like a moral badness, right? It's it's it is it is repugnant in the same way that Vogons are repugnant, both physically, both in the sense of being like hideous and distasteful, and I think um, from a phono aesthetic standpoint, you know, you think of uh, like the kinds of things that Tolkien would say about the about the relationship between the between ugly words and the meaning of words. Think how effectively. Um, uh, think, think, think how effectively this poem illustrates that, right? Um, this, the Vogon, is expressing what are plainly ugly concepts, right? Plainly disgusting uh, and repulsive meanings, words, thoughts, in appropriately ugly words, Right? Gabble blotchets is an intrinsically nasty sounding word, right? Um, uh, Gabber warts, blurgle crunching, bindle wordles, right? These are, um, these are, these are ugly words. These are unattractive words, which again means they're effective. They work. Um, so the horrible, horrible thing about Vogon poetry is that it's not worse than it is, right? If it were merely nonsense, if it were actually just nonsensical, if it conveyed nothing to us, it would just be slightly silly, right? But it's really painful because it works. It, it's a this is a very good nonsense poem, right? Um, very good in the sense of being effective. Um, unfortunately, what it is being effective doing is inflicting torment. Uh, so that's not so good. I wanted to go on and do their reaction uh, and uh, uh, Arthur's analysis of the Vogon poetry, um, but we're getting late now, and um, I. Uh, I'll 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 stop. I'll, I'll not hold us over late. Um, we can uh, we can get to that next time. Uh, so I'll start with uh, uh, the reaction to the Vogon poem uh, and their uh, and their discussion of it. So uh, so excellent. So thanks everybody. Um, thanks for uh, 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 coming along with me here tonight. Uh, I look forward to uh, finishing the Vogon poetry section next time and then moving on to the improbability drive and the heart of gold uh, for next time. Uh, keep an eye on that narrative. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at Signum University.